now. Beautiful. Oh, one more person in the waiting room coming in. Melissa. Give them. Hey, Melissa. All right. We are live. Um, she, Melissa's connecting the audio. And uh, I'll wait till that's okay. Melissa is live. Melissa, thank you so much for coming. Um, we're going to get started. We are recording, just so you know. And I'm going to do a very brief introduction and then turn it over to Yorgos. Um, Jubilee School is the political education, popular education project of the Deaf Collective. Deaf Collective, as a lot of you know, has been around since Occupy Wall Street. And in Jubilee School, what we try and do is gather people to think critically, strategically about debt and how to cancel it. Um, we focus on many different debt types, uh, whether that be war debt, which is really important to think through right now, student loan debt, medical debt, you name it. And we also try and um, build critical consciousness to build power, to push against various forms of debt in the country and around the world, recognizing all along that we also need to be aware of what causes debt, and that is a racial colonial capitalist system. So as much as we're interested in debt cancellation, we are very much interested in critiques that go further down. Of particular interest of the debt collective over the last year or so, has been the connection between labor and debt and labor movements and debt. Um, in the mainland U United States, you've probably been aware of the fact that labor has been gaining some power. There's been some important victories with the UAW, Chicago Teachers Union, other groups that have done uh, great work in pushing back against capital exploitation. And we are very interested in talking to these different groups and others around the ways that labor and debt intersect or at least need to be thought together. So along those lines, I had the pleasure of coming across this really great article from Yorgus uh, that I'm gonna put in the chat that kind of blew me away and in a way confirmed some beliefs that we have around debt and social control because when we talk about debt, we're not just talking about economics, we're talking about a political social relation and the ways that debt gets used to control people, discipline people. And Yorgos came up with some data that proved a point that we've been making for trying to make for a while, which is that when you have a lot of debt, there are many occasions where you don't want to go on strike for good reasons that Yorgos fleshes out in this piece. And so I uh, almost immediately wrote to Yorgos and said, hey, we got this project going on. Um, can you participate? And finally, the timing worked out so that here we are. Um, Yorgos is also in Europe and six hours ahead of us, so we want to be generous with his time, and uh, we will keep this to about an hour. We will have a presentation from Yorgos, and then we'll have plenty of time for conversation and discussion. Aminita, uh, thank you for joining us. We are just about to get started, so great timing. And I'm going to turn this over. We are recording, just so you know, so if you want to change your name and or image, go for it. And I'm going to turn this over to Yogurt, and then I will facilitate the conversation through questions and answer. If you have a comment you want to make, please write the word stack in the chat and or raise your hand so that I can keep track of who wants to say a few words or ask a couple of questions. So thank you once again, everyone, for coming out. Thank you so much, Yorgos, for being here. And uh, it's all you, my friend. Great station. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much. And thanks, everyone, for, for joining. Uh, I really appreciate it and very glad that we can talk all together about this very important issue. Uh, so I'll very much going I have a presentation which uh, I've prepared. I hope it doesn't get too too academic. Uh, but if you have any questions, just you know, stop me and we can discuss. I don't want to make this like a lecture. Uh, hope it's going to be more like. Uh, a conversation using this uh, as, a, as a template, really. Um, so, um, this kind of the general framework I use in my work to to kind of analyze this uh, this uh, this kind of problems around debt and why debt is is really uh, a labor issue. Uh, so. Um, Gonna talk a bit about my to begin with my motivation. What is missing and how debt is an important missing aspect. Way when we uh, 
analyze our workplace behavior and our political behavior more broadly. Uh, so I'm going to talk a bit about this and uh, yeah, what what is a possible solution to all that? What what's the way ahead? I guess. Uh, so from an academic perspective, I was always uh, so frustrated and amazed by the fact that when it comes to whatever is has to do with the, the labor market, there's a disproportionate myopic focus on everything's about technology and all that. And we, we really kind of ignore or overlook that, you know, the future of work is not about the future of workers per se. So uh, things that happen outside the workplace in everyday life do matter for what we do uh, in the workplace. And I think debt, debt is a prime example of, of that, how uh, us being tied uh, in, in a kind of, some kind of debt relation is really important for uh, what we do uh, in the workplace and in politics more broadly. So, yeah, I guess that's kind of uh, academic part from presentation. Financialization is, is another literature that has been linked properly to these uh, discussions. Uh, and if we define this, this idea, uh, financialization is, uh, happens basically when a non-financial actor or institution in the economy and society prioritizes serving its financial uh, its financial needs, payments or returns to shareholders, depending on whether we talk about uh, firms or households. But, uh, focusing on, on households, uh, that's, that's, I think, uh, a really, really important uh, thing, because this is really what is new about uh, the, the contemporary neoliberal regime, let's say, that started around the 70s, uh, the major shift was not that the financial sector per se grew dramatically, it's that the financial system shifted its focus into financing working class households rather than uh, big investors. And in my opinion, this is a reflection of welfare straight retrenchment. This is the driving force behind, behind this, behind how all this started. And this has four key pillars, which if you think about it, is the four key components of debt. The decline of universal public health care, uh, the decline of free public education, uh, the decline of free public transport infrastructures as well, and the decline of uh, social housing. So things that uh, for many decades were taken for granted and uh, constitute Im important safety nets for working class households do not exist anymore. So working class households have to pay for basic services that are not free anymore while their incomes are either stagnating or, or even declining. Uh, so in, in this context, I have, uh, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm totally against this this idea of consumerism that it has been very popular over the last several decades. Uh, the idea that when you get indebted for some kind of consumer good, it's necessarily something bad or evil. Uh, in my opinion, borrowing has become a necessity. Borrowing to access healthcare, borrowing to uh, get education, uh, even even borrowing. Uh, to buy a car when uh, public transport has become in many countries. And I can say that in the UK it's much worse, unfortunately, than many places in the US. Uh, buying a car has become a necessity for working class households uh, for, you know, to just go even go to work. And of course, social housing, which uh, the decline of social housing, which has created a huge, huge bubble as the private sector uh, crowded in the housing sector. Prime example is the 2008 uh, crisis, which is really uh, the outcome of all this. Uh, now, that's kind of the, the again, the, the academic framework, the general side. So for several years, there 
this idea that uh, non-financial firms that were highly indebted or uh, listed in the stock markets and very much focused on shareholder value maximization uh, so is, um, you know, quite popular. And there's quite a lot of discussion how this focus on financing either shareholders or financial institutions leads to worsening balance sheets for firms, which ultimately to balance this situation, they perform uh, cost-cutting strategies, which are in the vast majority of cases targeting uh, the most vulnerable stakeholder in uh, a corporate context, which is of course uh, workers. But there's also the question of how and when people resist to this tendency towards uh, precarity, let's say. So th this shift towards financing uh, working class households has two, two aspects. First is personal indebtedness, high personal indebtedness, but at the same time, uh, there is the pension fund side. So low incomes, uh, low contributions, uh, cuts in contributions by employers, has led pension funds to invest in risky financial assets. Not only our current income is in danger, but also our retirement income. So this kind of economic uncertainty and the constant fear of defaulting on your personal debt uh, is really associated with uh, our behavior in the workplace. Uh, others work in this area, and also some of my own work has shown that uh, highly indebted uh, working class households tend to be more self-disciplined in their workplace and comply with worsening working conditions to avoid getting redundant and ultimately uh, go, go bankrupt. So this is kind of the two sides of, of the same coin of how the financial system uh, has become very pervasive both for non-financial firms, which employ the largest share of the population, but also uh, workers. Uh, but this, the worker side is, is related to, to a number of areas. It's both about striking, as uh, uh, Jason mentioned before, but also it's related to the decline of uh, unionization, uh, among other things. So uh, to make this a bit, a bit more uh, I hope this is part of uh, a book I'm writing at the moment. It's not going to come anytime soon, unfortunately, but this how I try to, to, to summarize uh, how, how things work in this context. Uh, so yeah, focusing on the two main sides, financialized non-financial firms and financialized uh, working class households. So there are two tendencies from the corporate side, union busting or and avoiding hiring um, unionized workers very actively and on purpose. And on the worker side, because of the fear of default, there is a reluctance to unionize and, uh, of course, to strike because that comes uh, with a very high risk of getting redundant. We have seen over the past few years quite a few attempts, some more successful, some less successful, but in the current environment of labor market regulation and labor rights violation, uh, trying to form a union or go on strike uh, comes with a very, very high risk of uh, being replaced. Um, so in this context, uh, what I've shown in my work, uh, along with other colleagues is that these two parallel processes have contributed to the decline of union membership across the society but in particular in non-financial sectors and the lack of organizing is fundamental really so this affects directly of course industrial action when you don't have a union in your place it's very hard to organize and strike but also uh, Worker insecurity has a direct effect on industrial action if we talk about uh, some kind of wildcat strike that were much more common uh, in the past. Now, this taken together, the, the decline of 
union power and the decline of industrial action uh, have caused two, two, two parallel tendencies. The rise in formal and paid work and underemployment. So employers for employers now it's much easier, given that uh, workers do not resist actively to adjust their contracts, employ them in, in quite precarious contract or part-time uh, contracts and ask them to work uh, more hours. Or even in the, in the case of, of student debt, uh, in some systems that are quite predatory, uh, people have incentives to work informally because that uh, that income will not appear officially, so they, they will not have to go towards their debt repayment. So more money, they will basically get more money for their uh, everyday needs. And this, 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 all these parallel processes ultimately lead to a very very well established stylized fact uh, in, in the academic literature, which is that the, the share of employee compensation as a share of value added or GDP is steeply declining for more than three decades. In other words, real, real income of working class households is declining steadily. Um, now, of course, that what is interesting here is that this does not necessarily translate into high profits for uh, manufacturing non-financial firms. This is really income that ultimately end up then up back to private financial institutions in most cases. So uh, it's kind of the non-financial firms are exploiting their workers in order to finance uh, their creditors. Um, but what is also interesting, also from a political perspective, in my opinion, is that while all workers lose one way or another in the context of this process, we, we all do not lose equally. And that's important to, I, I think, uh, understand, especially from an organizing perspective. So uh, workers in finance, uh, in most cases, earn substantially more than uh most workers in in other sectors and this is because profits in the financial sector are more stable so firms there can afford higher uh, base salaries and also provide some performance bonuses uh, that is not to say necessarily that uh the, the income of workers there is also not uh, declining but the case is that they lose, but they lose at a much slower rate than anyone else, which, you know, it's always about comparison with others. They, in many cases, they think that, you know, uh, that's, that's slightly better than anyone else. So, yeah, there's quite a lot of evidence uh, that uh, workers in the finance sector tend to be politically more conservative because they, they get some benefits that limits their losses from from all this this process um and yeah now to, to conclude this what's the key takeaway in my opinion uh that yeah of course traditional trade unions still play a very important role protecting workers rights uh in uh, in the workplace in everyday life but again financialization is uh and personal debt is making organizing more and more challenging and uh Traditional trade unions should understand that they cannot achieve much on their own in the current environment. It's hard to organize people that are afraid because of the, the debt bonded relationship. So new forms of union, like the debt collective, debtors union or pensioner, pensioners union are really necessary. And uh, you know, achieving some restoration of workplace democracy and social justice across the society and the economy, in my opinion, requires much more coordinated efforts, efforts between these different types of unions. We should really embrace that, you know, working class life is not exclusively about what happens at the workplace. It's about uh, all, all different aspects, about education, about healthcare, about 
public transport, about social housing, and uh, traditional trade unions tend to forget that. Uh, so yeah, that that was it uh, for me. Wonderful, and there's quite a bit on the table here. Um, as everyone, as I mentioned to folks that were here earlier, we're going to make this available on our website um, for viewing, and we will see Yorgos's, um slides there as well. But we have a good amount of time for a conversation. We can expand on some things. There's a lot of thoughts that I had. But um, would anyone like to ask a question and or make a comment? Uh, the easiest way to do this is if you type stack in the chat or if you just want to like raise a hand, you could do so. Um, so the floor is open. If anyone wants to ask a question, make a comment, give people a minute to think about that. And if not, then I will definitely chime in. All right, let me ask you a question while people are thinking. Um, one thing that I find fascinating about some current labor struggles and the UAW, United Auto Workers, brought this up recently was that people are starting to talk more and more about like the necessity to fight for free time. And I find it interesting to think through debt through that lens as well. Um, so is there a way that you can help us draw some connections between debt, labor, free time, um, the ways in which when we fight for debt cancellation, we're also fighting for more time Likewise, when we fight for better wages, et cetera, because I think this is something that as people are more precarious, tired, et cetera, like we, we really need the rest, right? So is there any way that you could help us flush out nice ways to talk about this connection between work, free time, labor power, et cetera? That's, that's a very good point, and I guess it's related to, to, to what I mentioned about informal work or uh, underemployment, involuntary uh, part-time form of work, and labor violations that happen in the context of that. And again, I guess, yeah, the, the way to fight this back is through trade unions. But the, the, if we go one step back from what trade unions can do, Trade unions first have to mobilize people, have to increase their membership. Membership is declining steadily for, for decades in most countries. I mean, I think in the US now it's close to 10% of the workforce, if I remember correctly, and still declining. Um, so I guess yes, the, the first step to, to any kind of change in, in the workplace is yeah, for, for trade unions to, to realize what are the real obstacles to mobilizing people? And debt is is one of the perhaps the most important at the moment. So, um, without collaborating uh, in some way with debtors' union, in order, I mean, you may ask people to form unions in the workplace. You may ask them to go on strike. Uh, but if people are afraid that they're going to lose their jobs. Uh, that's really pointless. I mean, you have somehow to offer them some protection through debtor unions so they can feel safe to organize or go on strike. And then we can move on to the traditional, so to speak, uh, trade union fun functions and protect labor rights, offer good secure contracts, uh, a point of contact for people who experience this kind of uh, labor rights. Uh, violations. Uh, so I, I guess, yeah, it's again about looking at the big picture and uh, yeah, it's, it's traditional trade unions realizing that they cannot do this on their own. So I, I, I really appreciate this point. And I, I see Brian on stack. I just want to kind of summarize something that you said, because it's a way of thinking about debtors unions that maybe we haven't necessarily thought about a debt collective, which is a debtors union. So what you're saying is, Debt is an obstacle to mobilizing, organizing workers. And one of the ways to help 
debtors feel safer to organize at their workplace is if they know that a debtor's union, which may be separate from their other union, has their back or can provide support for them. Yeah, that's compelling. And, and I think just to expand a bit on that, I think it's no coincidence that we saw this wave of strikes and organizing during the time of COVID. Mm -hmm. there, there was eviction protection. Mm -hmm. There were debt relief measures, income supplements. Mm -hmm. People felt much safer at this time. The, the, the risk of defaulting was much, much lower at this time. Uh, I think that's, that's, that's not a coincidence that some people uh, kind of overlook, I would say. Yeah, I appreciate that insight as well. Um, Brian and others, please uh, consider making a comment, asking a question. We're all trying to figure this out. All comments, questions, welcome. It's different levels of thinking on this it can be basic, super complex, and hopefully you feel comfortable asking. So Brian, please. Yeah. So, you know, I work in, in higher ed at, you know, a, a public uh, um, regional uh, university here in the United States. And so I've been thinking a lot uh, um, lately about, you know, sites, spaces, um, institutions uh, that are, you know, positioned to be able to cultivate debt literacy at scale. Right. And I think higher education is one of those those spaces. But can you talk about perhaps that higher education as, as, as a site for, you know, raising and cultivating uh, an oppositional uh, consciousness to uh, to neoliberalism and uh, um, financialization, which is, say, mm -hmm. you know, a a set of interlocking systems uh, that make it impossible to 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 live and survive without going into debt. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I think that's uh, that's a very good point, and and I agree that universities and also this kind of political education projects are for general public are uh, very very important. But I think yeah, I guess it's 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 a bigger problem of our uh, public or private uh, higher education institutions or even uh, you know secondary education that have become kind of profit oriented themselves as well. So uh, we have broken down, uh, you know, intellectual curiosity, I would say, into small, small, narrow subfields, and we don't look at interconnections between different areas. So you become a specialist in a, in a very tiny, tiny area, and you have no perspective that this is linked to another uh, number of issues. So, yeah, I guess uh, it is important for, for those of us that work uh, work in academia or academic educators to try create courses and degrees that offer a more pluralistic a more holistic uh, perspective on how how the the world works outside of narrow uh, scientific fields and kind of yeah, combine insights from whatever fields can explain uh what we live in and this is i think very important because among others we train people that matter in everyday life so we train people that become middle managers uh in stores in small big cities small towns doesn't matter really uh and it's important to to help these people understand how the whole system works and uh, how they can kind of help others in everyday life and you know make th this world a bit more livable than it is at the moment. What do other people think? Questions, comments? Uh, does this resonate as a worker? Have you felt different pressures of debt that might keep you from mobilizing, organizing? Do you see this in colleagues? Are there struggles you're familiar with? Other questions you have about some of Georgios's um, analysis? What are people thinking?
Yeah, I'll just hop off mute to say this is resonating because, well, specifically as an hourly or wage worker um, who's in, in roles that's not considered like knowledge producing. Sorry, I'm eating a piece of chocolate. Um, that there's two things that are coming to mind. I sort of have an insight into stratification and hierarchy that really requires a safety or like an emotionality to organizing that I'm not able to receive because I'm not putting the time in because I'm working in hours that are typically where folks are usually considered to be off, um, like hours like this. Um, so my relationship to, to, with time is a bit different. So that's one challenge to organizing. And then the other is that emotionality, like feeling safe enough to sort of put my circumstances on the line uh, to imagine like a collective future that looks and feels different than what we're experiencing now. Um, so this definitely resonates and is really timely. So I'm glad I could hop on and listen in on this. And I appreciate um, you sharing some of this analysis and some of your thinking with us. Yojos, do you want to do you want to say something more about some? I love this point about the emotional uh, aspect, the risk, the the necessity for protection, and also too the way that debt, to put it bluntly, fucks with our emotions, our feelings of yeah. self yeah, guilt. Yeah, yeah. 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 I think that's uh, uh, that's really important. I mean, it, it's a kind of environment, I guess. Uh, it's li really the, the essence of neoliberalism. I would say, in a, in a way, that yeah, becoming financially sustainable and being at the same time some kind of uh, entrepreneur is is really what has been promoted as an economic and social identity and being. Uh, part of some profitable venture uh, has been worshipped uh, uh, for a very long time. Um, but yeah, I think it's, uh, I, I guess, yeah, the, the fact that this has touched over the last decades working class people, working class households to a great extent, pretty much because of welfare state retrenchment across many advanced or uh, high income uh, economies, whatever you want to call them, is really uh, emotionally destructive, I would say. Not only you don't have access to very basic services, but, you know, trying to get access to the services comes with uh, a specific bondage to a very, very unequal relationship. And it, it's really a predatory system, the, the way it has become. Uh, and, you know, work, work is an important part of our lives. It can be really enjoyable. It can, you can be really creative, but we are not precisely because uh, of the, the outside environment, because we have to work to repay our debts, basically, in most cases, which, you know, there is no joy anymore to work is really emotional torture and even if uh, you have a good job in many cases yeah everything goes to you whatever debt repayments uh, yeah yeah I guess the, the emotional aspect is the, the, this subjectivity around debt is, is, is really important other thoughts on this this is a really interesting thread to to follow up on if other people have feelings about this. Um, yeah, Melissa, please. Yeah, um, something in the article that you wrote, um, I think really like highlighted this point that people would be willing to like work jobs that are in worse conditions or lower paying because there is this fear of not being able to pay debts and that people are like, afraid of striking because of what that means for debt payments. And it makes me think about like the fact that we do see like solidarity strike funds that come up, but then people are talking about this emotional toll of if we have debts and we're ashamed of them, 
and they feel like a burden, we might not necessarily reach out to a solidarity strike fund for assistance if it's mm -hmm. debt related, which I think is an interesting point that you brought up around like how labor trade unions and a debtors union could work in tandem to support people. And then I'd also be curious what people think about this idea that the, for example, the Pennsylvania House passed um, a, a bill basically saying that striking shouldn't be, shouldn't bar people from receiving unemployment. Um, and so like, I don't think we can, I, in an ideal world, people would be willing to like reach out to solidarity strike funds because like our collective power is, is, all that we really have but if there is a measure in place where people do have this unemployment benefit while they're striking does that then support folks who are feeling burdened by this debt in a way that they might not have to default on it in order to go on strike um so i'm just like curious what other people think about that thank you so much for this can i jump in goes. go for yeah, it yeah. Yeah, no, what Melissa said is is very important, I think. Yeah, the the issue of strike funds is uh, is a really interesting one, and I have been involved with my uh, workplace union in discussions about that. And one important thing for trade unions to understand, traditional trade unions, that this process has much become much more effective, and when you plan a strike, you have to take into account those things that people uh, face these struggles. So yeah, I can say, for example, that my union has been particularly ineffective uh, when it comes to its strike fund. Uh, you have to wait till the end of the month, get your pay slip, uh, download your strike pay slip, then download your pay slip from the previous month, calculate the difference, submit all this to a very bureaucratic online system, and then wait for a few weeks to get a proportion of the money back. Now, in the meantime, people who may have a huge amount of debt will perhaps miss payments. Uh, it can be uh, both emotionally, but also real practical trust risk their, their lives in the context of that, depending on what kind of debt that is. So, um, yeah, yeah, I think. Uh, it is another really, really uh, uh, important aspect. It's how, how do we design effective strikes? Uh, at the moment, there was a quite interesting piece uh, uh, from some colleagues from Cornell, uh, I think a few weeks ago, I was reading about it, uh, saying that in the current environment, some mass but short strikes have been much more effective because many people can uh, join with a relatively small loss of income uh, and uh, make some gains instead of going on uh, poorly planned indefinite or uh, long-term strikes so yeah i guess the, the strike the strike fund thing is is a major issue uh, for trade unions and collaboration with debtor unions understanding that and planning this in a much more efficient way uh, will also be a step ahead. Yeah, and I really appreciate that point, Melissa, kind of echoing some of the earlier points about people feeling guilt to go to the strike fund to pay off debts that may be considered, you know, consumer debts or something. I also want to point out that Yorgos made this, I think, important move to call them household debts and not and not consumer debts because of the point that he made being that households need debt in order to survive given the low wages um lack of uh service public services and goods so I, I think there's so much in those in those very few lines there yeah. um yeah other questions or comments How, I am curious, have you tried to talk to different types of trade or other forms of unions about incorporating more debt analysis into their work? 
that's something that we've been trying to do at Debt Collective. So, mm -hmm. you know, we've had meetings with Chicago Teachers Union, um, different, you know, conversation with people on the UAW strike lines, other places mm -hmm. about, like, let's think about debt together. Can you bring that into your union analysis? Um, maybe that's a way to help mobilize, et cetera. Have you tried that at all? or And how's that gone? Or Yeah, no, <laughs> that's a very good question. Uh, I don't think I have a very good answer because things have not been going very well with that. Right. Yeah, okay. I, I, I would say, yeah. I, I think interestingly, in the US, unions are slightly more open to hear about these things and expand their agendas. In Europe, I'm not really excited about what's happening in the discussion I've had. I, I, I had discussions with people, for example, from the Trade Union Congress of, of the UK presenting something along the lines of what I presented today. And when I talked about, um, I mean, in the UK, we have um, some kind of renters, tenants, unions. Uh, and the reply I got from the Trade Union Congress, uh, a Congress governed by white old men who know how to run a union, of course, uh, was that why should we collaborate with such marginal organizations as tenants unions, oh <laughs> what they God. have to offer to us? Uh, yeah, so yeah, it, it, I think it will take some time, but I, I guess we, we all are trying our best mm -hmm. uh, to kind of you know, highlight these connections and that we need broader social coalitions and yeah, uh, yeah, get together in the same table and understand that, yeah, there, there, there is uh, power in a union between unions as well. Totally. In the US, we've had a little bit of success with like uh, faculty or teacher unions because teachers and faculty are so heavily in debt. Um, and they go into debt to do what is ostensibly a, a public good. And so people have been receptive to hearing like, yeah, how do we how do we make that part of uh, our organizing platform, like debt cancellation for people that have been doing this work? Um, yeah. Anyone else have a thought or comment? There goes one other follow-up. Uh, here in the US, there's a framework that sometimes people use and employ called bargaining for the common good. Um, this idea that when you go to negotiate contracts, you negotiate more than just your salary and benefits that you try and benefit, you try and organize for things like, you know, um, housing in the neighborhoods of schools or services mm -hmm. that might not typically be considered, you know, typical bargaining, uh, uh, platforms, um, mm -hmm. Has there, to your knowledge, has, has anyone ever brought up like a type of debt cancellation as a way to, to, to bring to the bargaining table um, that you're aware of? Do you know of any examples where people have said, you know what, we should actually try and bargain cancellation of debt for students, for adjunct mm -hmm. workers, or for, you know, our lowest paid staff at the factory, yeah. something like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. To, to be honest, I'm not, I'm not really aware. I mean, in, in Europe things are slightly better when it comes to student debt. Mm -hmm. uh, so th there is not so much discussion about uh, this thing, uh, but it will become more and more important in the future, I'm afraid, because tuition fees are going up. Uh, private specialized institutions that offer student loans are coming uh, into this discussion. Um, yeah, um, I, I'm not aware of any kind of discussion about this in, in Europe, to be honest, or I don't have any other example top of my mind. Mm -hmm. uh, but I guess, yeah, it's a much bigger issue, really. I mean, how, how did we end up in the course of a few decades from understanding public education, higher education, as a public good, healthcare as a public good, and uh, housing as a public good, and we have shifted to a model that everything is for sale. 
<laughs> and everything is an area to profit from. So um, I guess there is a moral case, but um, what, what I'm trying to to do kind of with my work when it focuses on incomes, when it focuses on form of forms of employment is that really this is destructive for the economy. Right? This is not by any means a viable system. You have people getting exploited because of this dead bonded. Uh, this is gonna not gonna last for long, one way or another. I'm afraid. Uh, yeah, you, you cannot exploit people forever. It's not even profitable for friends if you think about it. I mean, uh, if you work in such bad conditions, for how long can you do that? Can you be productive? Can you, you know, serve the society in any mean, meaningful way? No, you're just working to repay your debts. You're just trying to 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 survive. So. I think when we speak about cancellation, yeah, there's the moral case, which of course is a huge issue, but also there's the very practical side. If somebody wants to think about the, the economy, whatever this means, is that this is not really viable, even from an economic perspective. High inequality is not a good thing for prosperity or growth at the end of the day. Yeah. If there are not any other questions or comments, um, it is coming up on 11 o'clock for Yorgos and we should let them go about their night. Um, anyone else have any last things to say or ask? Um, I put myself on Slack just uh, as another like quick thought that I had about this, which is like how debtors unions could support trade unions in their strikes. And I'm wondering if there's a way to like flip and reverse that, where if we see like a strategic opportunity for trade unions that work in like finance industry that are planning on going on strike, similarly to how we like boycott when trade unions for like Coca-Cola go on strike, is there a way to incorporate a debt strike into a labor strike when it is at a targeted, um, a place that that holds debt for example and i'm just wondering like how like because these these issues are interrelated and how can we show that there is like a symbi symbiosis to that rather than just like debtors unions propping up trade unions whereas trade unions in strategic locations could prop up debtors unions as well but i read this is a really awesome conversation thank you yeah yeah i guess that's that's a very good point. I'm not sure about the legal side of things, but yeah, I think in the first place, there is a correlation between places that face bad working conditions and where people are highly indebted. So it's the same people usually face both challenges at the same time. Uh, and, and it's a very interesting point whether one could organize a coordinated strike about both issues and highlight that, yeah, uh, we have so, so low salaries that we cannot support ourselves in everyday life or finance uh, our debts. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure how you can do that in practical terms, but it's definitely, I guess, the, the, the way forward one way or another, unless we acknowledge that both are major issues uh, for working class you know, people, I mean, yeah, Do, doing things separately will not uh, incentivize people, uh, organize or, or participate in so this kind of uh, industrial action, strike action, whatever we want to call it. And I think on that note, um, we'll end with a line that we always say at Tech Collective, you are not alone, uh, meaning there are other debtors out there that we need to connect with and you also are not reducible to a loan an economic actor um so we give ourselves more dignity when we come together to struggle together i really thank you yogos for meeting with us for taking the time this is a really important and fascinating analysis and please always share with us your work as it comes out if we can help disseminate that we will do so you have a place in the United States to come and stay across the country whenever needed. Um, 
I will one last time put in the chat the site where you can see all of the past Jubilee School sessions. Uh, they are all recorded. This one will be up there in a few days. Thank you, everyone, for coming out tonight. Stay in the struggle. And um, cancellations on the horizon. We'll do it. Thank you, Yogos. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks very night. much. Take care. Okay. Good day. Ciao.